but I have a little intro talk. <laughs> That's kind of long. So we're gonna get through that together. Um, and It's on Trunk Stage Facebook, right? Uh, it is on HowlRound's Facebook, and I will be able oh, okay. to repost that in a bit. I have a little. But there we are. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Allison Chu. I am the co-founder and the executive producer of Trans Stage, and we are a Boston-based theater company dedicated to cultivating Asian American narratives in theater. So today's conversation is the fourth event of our online series, Trang at Home, which is a series of live streamed events curated by young Asian American artists off Trang stage and hoping to find community and to amplify the voice of Asian American theater makers through reading and conversations. So this conversation series pairs an early career with an established theater maker in their discipline. And we invite you to join the conversations to discover insights and momentum to delve into our future work. So today I'm excited to be in conversation with Meng Tongguan, the creative and executive director of Ping Pong Productions. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you How for are having you? me. Doing well, how are you? Great. Good. Um, where are you right now? I'm right now in uh, Queens, New York, um, with my family here. Great, great. Um, so a little bit about Meng Tong. She was born in Beijing and received her bachelor's degree in English and fine arts from Peking University. She was a regular contributor to Beijing National Center for the Performing Arts Magazine from 2009 to 2012 concert master of Peking University, symphony orchestra, and music instructor for Dean Dart that works with undeserved children in Beijing suburbs to build their self-confidence through concert, uh, to, through theater and music. So in 2014, Meng Tong was hired as production assistant for the China portion of Mark Moore's dance group's world tour and has since then been a full-time staff member with Ping Pong Productions in China and the USA. Once again, welcome. Um, so for those of you who are joining us on Zoom, uh, today we're live streaming this conversation on How Around Theater Commons our live stream partner. So if you are with us on Zoom, you can ask us questions using the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. If you're joining us on Facebook, you can also leave us a question there. So, um, Meng Tong, how are you doing? Like, I guess um, uh, in all aspects, what are some of the things that have been, that's been keeping you on your feet, interchained? I, for example, like I know I can't, like the, throughout this whole time, I can't let myself be bored and watch like binge watch TV or anything like that. I'm like such like a like nonstop working person. So what is it like for you? Uh, well, guilty as charged, I definitely watch TV because <laughs> most of the times I don't, first of all, I, I don't usually stay in one place for such a long time. I, yeah. I've been in New York since the end of December and attended the January conferences in New York and then just wasn't able to leave at all. Yeah. Um, so Netflix, <laughs> West Road. <laughs> so whatever they will, but, but as kind of a change of the, uh, the, the brain. Mm -hmm. um, I've been volunteering on a project uh, that helps getting personal protective equipment for the medical workers or frontliners here in New York City uh, or the greater New York area. And uh, regular ping pong work. Uh, we have launched with a KMP Artists, a leading agent, uh, agent company that's based in here in the States, but also out, uh, West spread in Southeast Asia and uh, Australia. So we have a series, we have an artist connectivity series uh, that's between the US and Chinese artists. So yeah. this has been going on, yeah, since March, uh, early March. 
a, a few of the projects to keep me fairly busy um, and watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. That sounds like sounds like a lot of projects. That's like not easy to do right now. As a lot of people mm. have been struggling with that. Uh, but I'm so happy to hear all of that project. Mm. All of the projects are still in process. So I want to ask you about that. Um, yeah. the the getting the uh, protective equipments for New York City hospitals. So that is N95 N95 for New York City. Yes. Um, tell us about it. I was so excited about it because you something that I uh, that I realized is that okay. you and your group initiated initiated this like mm. in response to what's happening so yep. fast. Like in within days, you were able to put together a campaign. You were able to put together a group of people and come come up with a full um, document stating the purpose in every single detail. So how did you, how did that come, came all together? And what was it like to put together that team? And what were some of the biggest challenges? Actually, I joined the team. So when I started, I, and when I realized the, the masks were, and the protective gears are not available at all in the States, um, I first wanted to start it myself. And then I realized uh, in my network of friends, there are several people who are doing it already. So I joined a, a, a existing, actually a, a pair of friends, not a pair, but <laughs> not a pair. So uh, two friends who work uh, in the individual arts, are, they are galleries and uh, are really great uh, curators. They have already started a campaign on GoFundMe that's just at the beginning stage. Uh, our first goal was only set as $25,000. Now we are reaching $60,000 on GoFundMe alone, and then many other channels of fundraising, I think, all together with donations and cash donations, uh, something around 400000 RMB plus the $60,000 uh, equal, equal or equal amount of the um, uh, protective equipment already donated to all the hospitals uh, and individuals and, and some nursery homes as well. Um, and the team actually came together very naturally as a network. It's a group of friends of uh, who happen it happened to be all female ladies, most of us oh, that yeah. are core in this. Um, Chinese uh, who are based here in New York work in the arts. So visual artists producer myself, um, gallery owner, Echo uh, He Yu is, is the, she's the owner of a gallery in Brooklyn and uh, own, it's called Fall Gallery. And then um, even Zhou Yuan, so she works at a gallery and there are the two that started first and then I joined when I found out they started doing it. That's wonderful. I think that's a wonderful instinct over there because I, mm -hmm. Um, cause you said initially you wanted to start it yourself. Um, yeah. and then you figure out, oh, maybe I like somebody out there with more resource than I have is already doing it. Maybe we can just like, form a group. That's incredible. Um, yeah, I have to say, sorry, I have to say, I think it's about, uh, because this initiative, it's about acting fast and filling the gaps between when the, a crisis started and when everyone else start to, with the most resources actually should be the government, everybody talk about, the government should be doing it, but it takes long, a long, longer time for a larger uh, system to react. So as individuals, I figured just contribute whatever ability and resources we each of us have in that group and then start it. Absolutely, That's yeah. Fun. And what I see from that, because my, because I live in Boston, I uh, like before all of this, like when I was hearing things, um, mm. like that was like early, very early January, like late February. Yeah. My 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 parents, my families in China are like, can can I send? Do you have protective equipments over there? Can I send you any? And mm. that was like. Um, and then uh, when it gets to mid-March, things become like, 
it's a community-wide crisis that all yeah. of the hospitals are asking for donations of yeah. uh, protective equipment. And yeah. I think part of that impulse to react so fast is to, you know, to take on this responsibility for the community that you're living in and calling for people who understand the situation, who are able to manage and to help the situation and get together and to, you know, just target the crisis of the community and to react. Yeah, I, yeah. that's like, to me, that's like a producer mindset, you know? <laughs> to me, that's well, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm proud for that. <laughs> So um, I want to know um, on the art spectrum of things, mm -hmm. what is it like to experience this as mm -hmm. a producer? So I know many of us had to do some incredible crisis management. The first yeah. week um, of, of all the theaters shutting down, everybody I'm seeing loss of um, in incredible crisis management on different levels. So how, what were your work schedules like and how are you adjusting to this what was what was the first week like for yeah. you yeah i feel my stretch has, has been longer because when it first started in china it's uh even before the chinese new year uh first things of course were discussions of canceling things that are already online like in, in the line but that fairly gone quickly and then um, we have two other producers that are based in China mm -hmm. and uh, we also immediately act, reacted and we wanted an online series of live streaming shows that are still going on which back then the rest of the world other than China still have things going on so we yeah. launched a live, uh, live streaming series of uh, live concerts from um, they were from Australia, from Hong, from Hong Kong, as they are, and from here in the States. So um, we've been busy for that project for a little while. Uh, and we made the decision we wanted the series to have really high quality performances uh, instead of a lot of the live streaming were. And of course, when back in China, when everything else are not available, people are just streaming from their computers like what we are doing now yeah. uh, but we wanted to stream the professional performances to engage our friends and clients overseas um, and then it, it started everywhere else and the shows are cancelled <laughs> another round of dealing with the cancellation and the schedule adjusting I was very actively attending uh, many of the online webinars or the discussions uh, with the professionals to, to know what has been done in uh, doing the contracts in the force major languages and what the uh, presenters are doing, what the artists are doing, the agencies, how everyone is responding in this. So just actively keep an eye out to what's going on uh, in the whole industry. And uh, kind of also the artist connectivity series uh, partially also emerged from these early conversations that uh, Campy Artist is an uh, existing uh, collaborator. We've been doing work together and then we decided um, to launch this. So I think it may come back to the uh, 95 NYC. It's a similar kind of mindset. There is a crisis, but uh, especially as a producer, it's impossible to just sit there and, and wait, wait it out, or just bury your head in the, in the sand. <laughs> <laughs> and just pretend nothing's going on. It's impossible to be like that. We have to take actions. And I think that maybe you're right. I think producers uh, for performances, we our role are we are used to be in the role of putting the resources together and support everyone to do their work at their best level. And this is the kind of the same kind of a response to the crisis and doing it in that way. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there hasn't been really a routine. It's a little bit impossible, a little bit impossible to really have a routine given in self quarantine with the family for I started since beginning of March. Mm -hmm. um, I just feel every day, sometimes I can't tell if it's it happened yesterday or, or actually two hours ago. It's hard to keep track already. 
I know. Now it's like difficult to keep track of time. And, yeah. Yeah. And I completely agree with you because as a producer, you can't just like sit there. Um, yeah, it's, like, hard. it's like the impulse is to do something. Mm. Um, so I was also like in, clo in close contact with lots of uh theater institutions like were yeah. me like low-key observing where what everybody's doing um and I feel like definitely people different people took on different approaches um and my one of my observation from like everybody's crisis management and response to the situation is like it's sometimes very um, between producers and producers of theater makers and theater makers because some believes, firmly believes in the power of gathering. Mm. Some are like, some are like, if we cannot gather, theater should not happen. Mm. We should just like take the time off and like, you know, making mm. sure everybody is like mentally okay and just, mm. you know, do not, let's do not drain ourselves out to like learning on another platform, engaging audience on another medium. And some of, some people are like, Arts needs, art needs to exist in the time, uh, a time like this. And we have to like use every single muscle that we have to put on something, something mm. for the community. Where I, I wonder, what's your like, observation <laughs> from what you heard all the yeah. things you participated yeah actually I actually I, I agree I think both of these kind of if I can call it mindset exist for their good reasons and I, I agree there is a reason to not stress out about um, the already very stressing situation right now it's it's okay I uh, I saw a post from a, from a friend who's also a producer, actually a guru from very early on in my career. Um, it's okay to not write King Lear like Shakespeare did during the pandemic. Uh, it's okay that you didn't uh, initiate anything during this uh, during this uh, crisis because it, it is a trauma uh, tra traumatic experience. It's it's not easy. It's very hard to process. Um, and I do see people taking a lot of actions and really trying to push it forward. I personally are, as you could probably tell, I, I do want to take more actions. I think it's both way or other way is a way to process this very special time in, in, the, in their own right, in their own way. Uh, but I do think these, uh, these throughout this time of volunteering and creating platform for people to keep in touch uh, and being in touch with friends and fellow colleagues. Um, keeping in touch and feel keep connected is the way for, for me to feel less powerless. So it kind of it can empower myself to feel this is the time that we are not disconnected with anyone else yet. It's um, it is a time that actually something will grow, like something will always grow after a crisis from the ashes. This, this is what I'm seeing it or what I'm trying to do. Uh, but I do agree to be really self-aware, don't burn out in a already very stressful time is, is a key. Yeah. Uh, and, and speaking of theaters, if gathering, if, if it doesn't gather people, it shouldn't happen. I think it's a good discussion. It actually come, came out um, in our call with uh, artists about online performance, online engagement and uh, virtual reality is, is a topic that we had last week. Um, some artists would say, and of course the VR and online engagement sh will never be able to replace the in-person experience because that's what performing arts is about. It's a whole rounded experience. It requires the, the, all the different senses to be engaged while you are in the theater. The audience is part of performance experience. Um, but the online engagement has its own purpose of existence. 
uh, and it has own its own te technique that if it's art, performing arts were not still in discussion, but still um, in discussion, <laughs> like I said. So, so I, I think it's very, very interesting, many things that we don't have time or energy to think about uh, during a so-called regular time can, can happen at this moment. I got you, exactly. I love that when you said, when you keep in touch with your friends, artists, friends, that yeah. um, you feel supported and you feel engaged in the community. And that's what I've been doing. I've been spending so much time. I, I, I saw all of your serious online talks and incredible. Thank you. It's like I, I, I spend so much. I'm never, I've never been so much a social media person. I'm just like figuring out a lot about social media right now. Yeah. Um, Twitter brings me so much joy. Um, I want to ask you that um, you work with artists across the world. You definitely have a much larger community, like in within your range. Um, mm -hmm. I guess you work, you work with artists across the world, people from Europe, Australia, Asia, you maintain yeah. a good relationship with all of them. So I guess um, I wonder um, if you can tell us about which, what you see in the arts across the globe and have you had a chance to talk to those artists yet? The theater makers, mm -hmm. the writers, the performers um, in different disciplines and how are they adjusting and have you thought of mm -hmm. ways to help them adjust? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the artist connectivity series, it's uh, the goal is, part of it is that we, our instinct is, or, yeah, producers are in touch, sorry, for business or for <laughs> taking care of the crisis and artists as well. Um, so uh, the first episode of our uh, series was about financial relief and financial relief and their sustainability actually turned out the artists were talking about what they were doing creatively every day to keep themselves entertained as well. Um, and uh, so not just between the US and Chinese artists, uh, I was on a call and chatting with Australian Art Orchestra, which is a, a collaborator we have and had a tour last year. Uh, they like what we are doing now, they have rescheduling challenges. And also um, very importantly, I think a lot of artists are thinking of how to keep the international engagement in the future as well, because traveling will be a challenge for not a few months, probably even a year. So everyone, even though now unknown how long this situation will, uh, will be, but, uh, actively making a plan to keep the international engagement in the right way. Because for example, in an orchestra and instrumentalist and how to really engage with each other on music when it's not in person, a Zoom call, there is always a <laughs> delay. And how can you jam with each other with a delay? Uh, maybe that should be a new music to be written. Uh, the music deal with delays, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so, so, I, the artists have been, and, and we have a collaborate, we have a collaborative uh, a choreographer, uh, Gu Jiani. She's actually on an ACC grant, an Asian Cultural Council grant, and have been in New York all this time. I think her original plan has never been just staying in a New York apartment <laughs> and not able to do anything else. Um, so we sometimes check in on, on WeChat. Well, I checked in with her like twice or three times just to see how she's doing and she's enjoying her yoga and, and uh, taking photos actually sometimes when taking a walk with social distance. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I similar actually, I think everyone, this is something also interesting, I think now that you mentioned, it's a globally collective experience of uh, the same crisis, which is, I, I guess, last time was a hundred years ago. I know, I know, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, frankly, I've been talking to, um, like, my friend circle, uh, I've been talking to a lot of writers. So, mm -hmm. um, I know some writers are doing some projects 
um, internationally. I, I'm very, I will be very interested to see like if since this is a global pandemic a global collective experience, what are some of the possibilities after this situation? Um, mm -hmm. And maybe there's some collaboration can be done, you know, globally. Maybe writers across the world can be writing for one prompt. Uh, maybe, maybe not in like the in-person medium. Maybe somewhere online. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. There, there are many things happen happening and happened online. I, I saw marvelous choreography from. I think it's from. Uh, Netherlands Dance Theater, uh, just their 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 choreographer, choreographer dancers doing this uh, a stream of moves that connect to the last person each other. It's a really beautiful short video that's been circling around. There are orchestras uh, live streaming performing the same the same piece. Um, um, and, and I think some are across the globe. And I, I don't know if you guys watch uh, more more entertaining side entertainment side. There's a one world together at home uh, yeah. done by the girls assistant. And that one I saw like Yo Yo Ma and Long 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 was separate. And Yo Yo Ma and uh, his fellow musicians doing one piece together. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of the artists are definitely doing the same. And I saw. A Facebook post from a classical musician um, said, "In the past, musicians wouldn't do anything uh, unless you pay them. <laughs> now they're like, look at me! I'm on Facebook live and free. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I, I can't say I encourage that that kind of uh, <laughs> that kind of thing. But as for donations, musicians, if you want to put something on Facebook live." Um, it's rightful to put a link under there and say, please make a donation. <laughs> yeah. Totally. We're going to, we're going to come back to that. Cause I want to talk sure. about, um, uh, that all of that online stuff happening. Um, I wonder, I wonder if we can get into, um, some of the details about the international producing work that you do. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder how did you get started with Ping Pong Arts and what was your first project with them? Mm, right. Um, and thank you for making that introduction in the beginning. <laughs> that kind of remind me how I started. Uh, with Ping Pong, I first started on a tour with uh, iconic American dance company, Mark Morris Dance Group. They're based in Bro Brooklyn here. Um, mm -hmm. So I was actually, I just finished uh, a second time kind of internship or in uh, at uh, Lincoln Center Festival, um, and then had a kind of a gap month and gap month. Mark Morris <laughs> gap month. Uh, Lincoln, uh, sorry, uh, Mark Morris Dance Group was having a tour in China, yeah. um, and um, the founder of Ping Pong Productions is Allison Friedman, who's now the artistic director at West Kowloon Cultural District for the Performing Arts. Um, we. I got to know her through networking in the professional world, just friends of friends or the mentors and the gurus uh, and introduced me to her. So I joined that project to be the production manager. Um, so it was, uh, I remember it was like a four, about four months long project. Half of it was done here in New York, uh, helping with communication with theaters for the production director. And then half of it was uh, on tour with the company in China. Uh, I think we were in two or three cities, I don't remember. Uh, so yeah, so I was doing translation and I was doing uh, partially the production management um, and helping on the company management. So that was my first touring experience and also the first project was ping pong. Uh, and then I came on board um, as a full-time ping pong player. Uh, and our first tour when I was Full time was uh, early in uh, February, I think, 2015. We, we toured with Tao Dance Theater to India, uh, Bangalore, um, for a week or two weeks. That was a great experience as well. Oh my God. How, what was that experience like? Like the first time 
production assistant experience like for you? Was, was there mm -hmm. like a moment for you be like, it's it just like the whole experience just like clicked for you. And then you're like, that's exactly what I want to do. Was there a huh. moment like that? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, okay, I, can, I, I kind of have to wind it back to when I was still in college. Um, so I was I was I was a I was a English major, uh, so so there, there once there was so so first of all I've always been active on stage either just as a musician myself or and in, actually in high school uh, in the student orchestra I was a concert master so I also helped with some kind of the student admin side, including oh, how the stage should be set up for a concert and how to coordinate schedule when I need to play like a small ensemble work with some of the, the friends in the orchestras. So that I think that part kind of grows slowly and I know what it is. I kind of have an idea of what should be done, kind of learned it by doing throughout. And of course, in college, uh, the internship I did at the, the China National Premier Center, even though as a um, writer for them, for the magazine, we had a summer series uh, to produce a series of concerts in uh, there on the on the stage outside of the concert halls in the common area. It was done by our orchestra, so coordinate schedules and what is what are the what are the programs and okay conductor, what is your need and how, who have enough time in the summer vacation who are, who are still in Beijing to do it. So I think the producer's work, I didn't know that was the producer's work. Of course not. Um, but then it just learned by doing. Um, and at Lincoln Center Festival, um, I, I did it twice in 2013 and 14 as a company management assistant, which is all about scheduling keep up in the schedule and um, personal interaction with different artists, different genres of artists. The musicians need something different from the dancers, from the theater people. And a lot of them have to deal with international flight that's really long and take a day off and what they need backstage, what they need on the day of performance. Um, what are the events like after the show? Uh, and take them out after the first show for a party. So a lot of those, um, that was, I, I would say I did get started on quite a high requirement of the quality of work at Lincoln Center. Um, I'm still grateful for my groups there. Uh, a lot of them still keep in touch. And actually in collaboration last year, we had a pro program uh, for opera that came through my, my, my old boss, my first boss ever. <laughs> So I'm very grateful for that, for that experience. Yeah. Um, I think learning by doing is a, a lot of what producers, how the producers learn uh, on their jobs. Um, uh, and my graduate education in arts administration at Indiana University, I would say, gave me a really great overlook and framework of what is a nonprofit uh, goal or mission that I need to think about when doing uh, throughout the planning phase of what when we want to do something and how the management is done in the way that's efficient and uh, uh, benefit the mission at all times. I think that gave me a really good uh, brain structure and the and the a very fruitful um, brain framework to be able to do my work right. I think I kind of direct the question further down the path, but yeah, to answer short, I don't. I think learning by doing. <laughs> yeah, no, I got you. I got you. I can relate to that so much. Like, there's two things that's so reassuring for me. First is I started out like doing lots of the like. Uh, um, in front of laptop, like work, organizing, scheduling, purchasing yeah. stuff, not knowing that it's called producing. And then like afterwards, 
I had people tell me, hey, that's producing. I was like, wow, really? Um, and mm -hmm. second thing is that like me, I was just mentioning that I, I'm about to graduate college. Um, <laughs> and I wonder like, was for a producer, how can an MA, MFA program in arts administration, theater producing, push you forward down into that lane? Because mm -hmm. there's no theater producing administration, at least from my knowledge, like mm -hmm. level of undergrad work mm -hmm. on, in the college level. So mm -hmm. I think like now, right now thinking about it, I'm like an MFA in theater producing. It's definitely like something that can, you know, wrap up yeah. and you're doing. Yeah. Um, so I wonder, have things changed um, since you take over the steering wheel? Um, there, there was a definitely a graduate change. Uh, a lot of the performing performance tours we manage and the, um, the clients were collaborators we still worked with and but slowly less projects naturally kind of a uh, a little bit less of that but uh, have your emphasis on the education outreach uh, uh, on both sides but especially in China and first of all all the performance tours professional tours in the past has always been that case but now a heavier uh, emphasis on every tour need to be having an education lag in the other universities, which is part of it a lot of times, uh, but also uh, schools and migrant children's uh, schools. We we started a collaboration with a local foundation in China. They have been supporting arts education in the migrant children's school for years. And so we came in naturally as a program partner to provide more content for them, artist performances in the uh, schools. We had a jazz concert for like, uh, I think about 2000 kids uh, outside of Beijing in, in Hebei, um, two hours drive into a very different landscape from Beijing to perform there. Um, and that, uh, that kind of uh, activities in the past has always been part of ping pong's engagement. And that's what allows the artists, not just the, the students or the young people in China to experience something they have not been able to access a lot of times, and, uh, but an in-person contact face to face to see an artist in action, what it is like to have someone performing for you on the stage right in front of you. Uh, especially for the migrant children, they don't, a lot of their families don't have uh, access or awareness of uh, this can be part of their education or experiences growing up. Um, but also for the artists to be able to go somewhere that they, they've never thought about, oh, that's also part of China. That's not Shanghai or Beijing, the big metropolitan areas, the huge, uh, metro uh, like the, the development or the modern cities but there are something different um i think that 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 also came from my background when i was uh still in college doing the volunteer works for the children kind of carries through in there so ping pong in the past two years we have uh, much more of that uh, we started a structure to work with producers that they can they don't have to join ping pong as full-time producers they can bring in projects and lead projects themselves. And, uh, um, and the, the existing members can come in and support them with st strategy making and reaching out using our network. So that's still imbued and here, I see a lot of attendees here <laughs> who are the producers and interested in learning more. So ping pong, uh, we are still building that. We want to work with more independent producers too. Uh, work on different things together and who are um, in into this the beginning of their careers and want more experiences and and I guess do the producing work right in uh, more quality like seeking for the quality and the mission why you do it and who are you benefiting to kind of train the brain of producers together so this is what ping pong 
is into uh, in these two years as well, uh, which is actually also an existing program in the past. Uh, we have worked with Australian Council for the Arts and, and, and Singapore um, Art Council, a National Art Council to host uh, producers from other countries in China to have that experience. Now, I think, so, so why not focus on more of the younger bilingual Chinese producers as well? So yeah, um, so I, I would say these are the two major, um, I wouldn't say a shift, uh, but uh, we're strengthening this more. That's incredible. I, you know, something I, I'm really, really excited about is that I've never seen or heard, I, I know fellowships that are delica dedicated for um, theater leaders, administrators, um, but none of them, I don't think I've ever, ever heard any dedicated to creating experiences for mm. producers, especially this whole idea of early career, young producers. Mm. And people constantly have this notion of, if you are a producer, you have to be experienced. You have to, you need to have a lot of connection. You might be in the industry for a very long time, but you are a producer. Um, That's an interesting idea as well. I would say, I, I would say producing is a mindset. It's a learning curve. I think a lot of my, personal uh, yeah. mentors will agree with me as well it is a curve of learning that it's a lifetime learning you have yes. because there's always something to learn uh something new and willing to do when you are a producer so and why not start it young and fresh and just um <laughs> do it uh when you're interested and want to join this kind of an army <laughs> of producers yeah. Right. And that's like the whole, like the framework of this. What are we like? Why are we sitting here together? Is me thinking nice. that, you know, like maybe there needs to be a space for young producers. And I actually like use the, 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 the words like young producers. So yeah. that's why we're here. So um, thank you all so much for being here, our young producers. Um, so excited to work together. Okay. Um, and another aspect that I want to talk about is that I hear um, that a huge part of, um, well, I guess the change that you brought to ping pong since you took over is that you reinforces the community engagement, the education aspects of mm. the work that you are able to bring to places. And I think that is incredible and something that I was so like, intrigued when you first told me is that when you brought the tour of disgrace to China and how you were able to do amazing community engagement along around that production and having talkbacks mm. in college, uh, high schools and having conversations with um, the, which the, with the teachers, instructors having be able, being able to teach that script in class. And mm -hmm. at the same time, having them watch the production. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit more on that? <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, I also do want to come back and say ping pong from, from the beginning when it was set up, when I was set it up, it's always been a side-by-side -side education and performance um, in both ways. Either it's for international artists going to China or Chinese artists going elsewhere. Um, it's always been a parallel. A lot of people will say, oh, you guys do a lot of things, many things that are seemingly different from each other, but we see it as integral part to each other because understanding in a certain depth and keeping it growing, it, it, it's, a, it's a process. It's not just, oh, I, I go in there and see a show and then maybe forget about it the next day. So that's not what ping pong does. Okay, come back to this grace and exactly to this kind of a mindset. Um, if you don't know about the play, someone on the on the call. Um, so it is a Pulitzer winning playwright, uh, Ayak Akhtar, a Pakistani American. Um, he wrote a play about a uh, Pakistani lawyer living in New York, going through uh, his life um, of being, mistreated and misunderstood 
understood as uh, uh, a person post 9-11. And throughout this, um, I think it's the, the, the story spanned is a, a, around several months that he was involved in the legal case um, and then was accused of supporting terrorism, which he, he was not. And he had a crisis with his wife. And uh, there, the, the, the main part of the play is around a dinner party um, between a Pakistani American, which is himself, his wife, which is a Caucasian, and his colleague, which is an African American female, and the colleague's husband, which is a Caucasian Jewish. Um, so just Hearing this, it's very, I would say, even stereotypical <laughs> American uh, political theater play <laughs> about race, about racial relationship, uh, which seemingly is very far from what a Chinese audience would be into or immediately understand. Uh, our thought, it, it's a, it's a Please a winning play, and we love uh, all of everyone on team uh, of ping pong. Love that play, but we immediately realize we have to give enough cultural background for whoever come into the theater or come across this play to understand what it is. Because uh, in the play, there are also violence involved, and it really it makes uh, Amir, the the pro protagonist, look really really bad. But Clearly, we also want people to feel the sympathy for the protagonist. So how to really balance all of this? Um, we took a long time to, to really discuss around it, what is the right way and what is the, what is the, the, the way to make it communicate what we think the playwright wants to communicate to an audience who, doesn't, who not necessarily are familiar with this kind of cultural background as a result. As a result, our first tour of the uh, play was a tour in the universities and uh, high schools, basically alone, only in university and high schools, um, with advanced study materials mm -hmm. um, in the either their English class or their club or their theater club in the in the universities, um, and when it is possible, the the English teachers or professors will share the script with the students in advance, sometimes even at the beginning of the semester and make it part of the reading materials they have in the, in the school. Um, and then uh, by the time that we get to, we, and, and we put together a cast, um, invited a, a director, Tim Douglas actually is a professor at Emerson College now, um, yeah. Uh, and a group of really incredible off-Broadway and, and Broadway New York. I think most of them are in New York. One is on the West Coast uh, act actors. Tim helped us put together as well uh, to do a tour in, in those schools and universities. So by the time these real actors are in their, either in their classroom or in their uh, 1,000 uh, student hall, 1,000 people student hall, they have already read the script and understand, and there, there is a teacher, teacher's package. They understand the, the cultural background, they know what this play is about and then see it live. So that's a whole rounded experience of understanding it from a cultural perspective, not just from a, and plus a theoretical perspective. So that was a conscious, very conscious decision to make it accessible in the most, well-rounded way that we can possibly arrange. I think the whole program took us about really close to two years to discuss about it and then get funding to support it because going to schools and universities, it's, it's, it's definitely not a professional play. There is the ping pong carries the fee and the payment to the artists um, and the cost and we, sh we, we do some share costs with our hosts as well, definitely, and all of them are excited and supportive. Um, so there was, uh, I think, eight cities and 13 institutions that we went to for the first one. And then the second year, we came back to, to and did a professional performance in Shanghai. Wow, yeah. So, yeah, I'm so proud of that, like, 
tour touring the the whole project because I I frankly knew the project before I got to know you, um, yeah. and then it was like I got to know who you had like, a discussion. Like, yeah, like, <laughs> all of this, and I wonder since you were talking about like the funding for this project specifically because it's uh, performing in universities and um, education institutions, high schools, um, and the funding for this maybe um, came in a little differently. I wonder, like, as a global presenting institution, presenting work, like lifting work here in the US, like take it to China, lifting work from China, take it to the US. Um, what, what are, how do you approach um, funders and how do you like, fund, how do you find the appropriate funding strategies for the project you're working with? That is a good question. For us, each project is quite different. Um, there are different foundations and uh, sometimes we need to talk to corporations and ind individuals. For the Disgrace Tour, there were incredible individuals just came in and make, made donations into making that happen. And without them, it, it's impossible. So I think it's always, when it comes to fundraising, it's always about uh, finding the common ground that you have with someone potentially want to make it happen as well and support you to do it together. Um, it's, it's either for a, a, a performance uh, program like this or raising, uh, raising funds for, for PPE, <laughs> for the personal protective equipment. Uh, when there is a need, there is urgency. Make people to feel, I have the urgency to help you help it happen so it helps me to realize what me alone is not able to do. So I think that comes back to the mindset of producers, how important it is to be able to communicate a common um, uh, value that people will agree with each other. It's not just about come help me, it's about uh, we want to do this together. Yeah. So yeah. So that's that's I would say a lot of these projects happen this way. So and that's why uh, when it comes to found found uh, funding support, uh, ping pong goes to different resources. Sometimes government agencies as well, and foundations, public institutions who want to host the the events and do cost shares and pay for a fee. Um, and yeah anyone we can think of yeah. and, and when it's an incredible project that we we want to promote the common understanding between the different cultures and people it always come down to that yeah yeah so i wonder speaking of that what are some of the things when you're looking for when you are using your project so this is like going mm -hmm. a bit back to like yeah, the, yeah this whole mindset what are some of the things you look for um like qualities when you look for or, or either you go on the, the just like follow your impulse way um, mm. to have like a logic or like a grid that you, in your mind then when you're looking at projects you want to work with mm. definitely something uh, it's a little hard to really give a guideline these are the things we, we look and those are the ones we not it's never like that but the qualities we look for um, apart from the integrity, which I believe uh, a lot of the work shown to people need to have the integrity and the kind of the quality. So people, uh, if we say what art, what art can bring to people, I would say it's, it's wisdom and compassion. So a good art needs to have both. So that's why we look at the integrity. And at the same time, it brings something that we feel or we know that a lot of other people were in a certain community haven't seen yet. It kind of helps them to break through a certain stereotype, a st stereotypical idea of, uh, for example, maybe a lot of the Chinese companies that tour internationally are uh, acrobatics or very traditional work or, mm -hmm. um, um, or larger productions maybe. Um, but when Ping Pong works with the Chinese artists who make their works, it's contemporary, it's a lot of times challenging. Um, it, can, it can be as contemporary as anyone you can think of 
there. They are come from Europe or uh, off of Broadway in New York. So those are the work and, and of really good quality that are uh, sought through by a lot of the festivals and, pre um, and presenters worldwide. So, so those are the works we, we really like to uh, collaborate. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. That I, I always call, sometimes I call producer um, dreamers in the industry, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I wonder, I wonder on top of all of that wonderful project, um, all those wonderful projects, what is your absolute dream project as a producer? <laughs> oh boy. Oh. <laughs> I, okay, I, I would say Disgrace was one of them. Uh, mm -hmm. When I saw the work first in New York, I, I knew, even sitting in the audience, I, I, now I look back, I was thinking, oh, I, I wish the Chinese audience could see this, could be sitting next to me and, and all see this uh, work that really bring out the vulnerability of someone fighting for identity that's not just himself and but also a cultural identity so that I think that that was something that I felt really strong for myself at, at that moment um, so I would say my dream projects are are going to be something like this like disgrace when I feel the really strong personal connection with the work whenever and wherever I see it I'm able to realize it uh, through a certain way, either it's a work even hasn't been made yet as a producer and, and, and working with artists and hearing an artist pitching an idea, get excited with artists together and get the co-commissions and, and, and make things realized. Um, so I think, um, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm, an, I'm, I also see myself pretty much as young producers still if, if you look at people how many years they can work in this industry they can work until their 70s <laughs> when they are in their 70s or, or 80s yeah. some yeah i had a professor at indiana university who used to be a very one of the very early uh festival director in i think in in adelaide adelaide festival in in australia and he was still teaching our classes at 70 years old um and just yeah I, I, I those are the people i i really admire and i hope the so-called dream projects will keep coming to me where i keep finding them uh across the globe and throughout the years that i'm able to be alive <laughs> yeah totally like i feel like dream projects is sometimes you maybe maybe you have like things that you love and also like running into artists that that are able to you know just turn this into like whatever medium they have in their hand whether it's dance whether it's music whether it's theater um and then you two come together and becomes the dream project mm -hmm. and then afterwards and you you come back and be like wow that was the dream project yeah go ahead yeah yeah no i was going to say i think for for me the Producer's role is a lot of times and always about empowering the artistic vision of artists, um, what they see possible, and sometimes come in as a resource and a power to help them see it further. Um, I see this is possible, but maybe we can do more than just this. So throughout this process to work it out together, I see this is the role of a what the producer is able to do. And I definitely see it as a supportive role um, for everyone when it comes to not just the artist. And when there is a team, there's a technical director, there is a, <laughs> uh, there, there is a company manager, there, is a, there are a lot of different roles in the, in, in the team, in that cohort. And the producer should be kind of the glue in there, um, yeah. but also occasionally knock on the door and hey guys, uh, there are something else as well, kind of make the contribution on the side, uh, but not ha not stealing it from anyone else. So I, I, that's what I what I see the producer's key role is. 
I absolutely agree. So for those of you who are joining us on Zoom or either on um, Facebook, I have one more question for Montone. And <laughs> if you have any questions, we're going to open up the floor after this so, so that it's not only just me talking. So since we are already touching on this a little bit, um, what is, in your opinion, what is what are the essential skills for and how to improve? I would say, like in my directing class, I come into this term called the director's craft, um, mm. or an artist's craft. What do you think is a producer's craft? Mm. <laughs> wow. Um, I actually do have some notes for this because I saw the question. It's, it's really, it's a brilliant question. Yeah. I did touch on this a little bit. I think, first of all, is the willingness and the ability to really virtually learn anything that you might come through and willing to do it. Uh, I would have some examples to give, like when you see there is a whole I have to fit in here right now mm -hmm. when a show is happening or is about to happen, that the producer usually is the person willing to jump in at any role, sometimes even just screw a chair together <laughs> when uh, the chairs need to be to be fixed uh, in the in the theater, so so just the willingness to be anyone. Yeah. Um, and I think it requires a certain ability to be a very calm and confident person that kind of um, gives the the kind of the vibe and the power that people know I can rely on you on solving problems, even though inside or the inner you is like panicking, what am I gonna do? But but on the surface, when there is a there is a, either an emergency or a crisis, the producer usually need to be the person that's really calm and able to make the best call for everyone in the team, kind of like a mom's role in a lot of sense. Um, and another thing, um, the ability to listen and share, to truly listen and share, very open to everything. So that's in the process of when helping, giving the helping hands to your artist and to the presenter or to anyone else uh, in, in, in one project. Uh, to to be that person that's solving the problem, uh, but also at the same time listening to everyone's need in there. I think it's a it's a it's a kind of a skill that, that uh, come very handy uh, solving problems. And those are a lot of other skills and and really practical ones like <laughs> raising the money and grant writing and. Yeah, I would say basically anything. I I don't even know how to. So so at first I I I don't think I even consider myself as a producer. And more more recently, I I would start to use the term "Oh, I'm a performing arts producer." But at first, I felt like, yeah, I'm a touring manager for the performing arts. I'm a production manager. I I'm, I'm a translator. Uh, and then I figured, oh, producer. And and where I, I I'm a fundraiser for some project, um, but the producer is a kind of all of those, and and, and more and always growing. I don't know. I don't know if other producer will agree with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I had a so I have a um a, a dramaturgy teacher who once told me that um that I need to work on my writing, and he goes. You need to write for grants someday, so you really have to work on your writing. And I was like, that makes exactly. so sense. I was like, you know me so much, and you you just like like just like grapple like the core of me and go like, you need to write for grants, therefore you need to write. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, and I totally I feel like this all come back to like. The, in the beginning that we were talking about the um, being able to respond to the community's need and they, mm -hmm. the ability to hear the need is definitely a, like a huge part of the essential skill of a producer. So thank you so much for like 
wrapping that up perfectly. That was like, thank you. Perfect Good question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, it seems like we have a question for, for okay. a writer in the room. Um, so thank you so much. I'm just, this question's in Chinese. I'm just going to translate it. Thank you so much for sharing. It was, um, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, a question is, uh, would, what, what are the plays that you're reading? What are um, doing this whole quarantine, the lockdown uh, month? Oh, for me? Yeah. I think you should share first. I think you, you are the person who's likely more likely that are reading plays. I'm, I'm watching <laughs> Netflix. <laughs> well, I read, I basically read plays sometimes mainly for my classes. Like, mm -hmm. but right now, graduating, I'm learning like to read beyond like the class trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, one, one play that I've been reading um, is that, well, I've been reading a lot of, of short play collections because I've been mm -hmm. looking for the short play, short play collections, especially short play collections by Asian American um, writers looking at like my next project. Um, and one play that I recommend is um, this play called The Children by Lucy Kirkwood is, <laughs> yeah, it's called The Children. It's a brilliant one act. Um, I saw it at the Speak Easy Stage Company at Boston um, right before everything was canceled. So it's mm -hmm. a brilliant play. Um, and I, I also I also write. So I honestly think that is a wonderful example of how like like sometimes we call like a play so well written, we call it so tight. I think it's a wonderful example of brilliant playwriting. Everything's so tight. And it's also about um, uh, it's also written on the backdrop of the environmental crisis. So I'm not going to spoil it for you, but if you want to read it, it's called The Children by Lucy Kirkwood. Lucy Kirkwood is a British writer. So that's one play that I recommend. What about you? I just wrote it down. Oh, I have to share. Um, you can share a Netflix series. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I, I do have a share on the, on the next, uh, Netflix series. There is one called Unorthodox. It's a... Uh, it's, uh, it's only it's only for episodes for a story that's based in Williamsburg, New York. Um, not going to spoil it, but it's it's about a it's about a young lady uh, escaped from a really traditional uh, community, Jewish community in Williamsburg, and escaped to Berlin and trying to pursue her dream, being a musician. And I, I think the, the amount of the details of the different cultures in that um, TV series is, is incredible. And I learned so much. Well, the, I, I only hear stories or acquaintance, uh, the stories of acquaintance, what it is like uh, in that community in Williamsburg, a very, very traditional uh, Orthodox, Orthodox uh, community that live basically the life of a hundred years ago still, um, but that that TV series gave so much more details and understanding it. And, and one of the, the more reasons is that during this epidemic, um, that neighborhood, I have a really close friend who lives there, uh, just down the street is the community. And for her, it's not very, uh, it's not easy to understand why during this kind of uh, shelter in place period of time, People will still gather for their religious uh, gatherings and uh, not being really aware of where they're aware, but they feel it's more important to attend a rabbi's uh, funeral instead of uh, stay home and stay safe. Yeah. I'm kind of trying to understand that. Uh, I think that series in some way helped me. So that's one. Netflix is, is useful, it's very artful. <laughs> uh, if you choose wisely what you watch. And another thing I started reading, actually only, I'm only halfway through. Uh, I started reading before, I started reading in December. It, it's called Land of the Seven Rivers. It's actually about the, um, it, it, I think it's an old book. 
why I need to keep reading it. I, I, I pause for a little bit now. It's about the geographical history of India. Uh, the reason I'm looking at this is um, more and more thinking of this so-called Eastern and Western uh, very, what's the word, binary um, kind of uh, the way of looking at the world is still quite much. I think China even less, a little bit less so maybe, but still quite the mainstream of how people see the world today. This is the modern world, this is, this is the East, this is the West, um, but it's actually not. And what are the wisdoms that are from the, the, the history of humans that are shared through this kind of book? So I am, I'm getting a lot of inspiration from, from this. Um, yeah. And before that, it's uh, <laughs> just sharing a lot of books I'm reading. Uh, before that, I highly recommend uh, is a Chinese writer, um, uh, Xu Zhuoyun. So he was a professor in Taiwan, also here in the state, I think University of Pittsburgh. He writes incredible books about culture, cultural history of Chinese, um, of Chinese history, uh, of Chinese culture. Um, I say it's the arts and cultural history because he writes a hi perspective of history, not from the, uh, the perspective of states mm -hmm. and uh, the emperors and and the changes of the power, but from individuals and from the, the Lao Bai Xing, the, the commoners. What is it like? Uh, how do you see history through some um, stories that have so many different ver versions in different regions of China that are shared throughout their generations and what it says about uh, the, the the culture, the history of culture of China. So I read I've read some of his books in the past, and then there was a new book I started reading last year. I'm finished. Yeah, highly recommend. That's incredible. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing that. I think thank you so much for the book's recommendations. I'm constantly looking for book recommendations. Um, <laughs> If any of you in uh, joining us on Zoom have any book recommendations, I'm totally open to it. I like in three days, I will have absolutely, absolutely nothing to do in my, with my life. Um, <laughs> well, I, I feel like I have like one last question, but this is like also something that you were just talking about, um, about your books. And I feel like right now this is like very relevant. This is like a bomb dropping in this conversation is that, um, I think a lot of people differentiate transcultural theater and the diverse voice on stage that yeah. directly speaks to racial tension. Yeah. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of the work that trans stage does is to make efforts in blurring that fine line between transcultural theater, theater from another country, theater in another language, and yeah. um, theater that speaks to racial tension. Um, like working closely in the US, US and China at the same time, what is your take on this? Like, how do you, how do you envision like a cross, like a cross point um, between the two that's basically, they're produced very differently, at least mm. for, like, how do you envision this? How do you, what, what's your take on this? Yeah, this is interesting. Um, I had an original thought when I saw the question, actually, I think the, uh, to think really theater is about theater and it's about sharing um, so that uh, everyone in the theater, either the performers or director, probably playwright themselves, and the audience have a shared experience to understand something, to be empathetic and sympathetic of something together more after seeing or experiencing this play. So there is no, I don't think the purpose of such a distinguish of like, this is a, this is a foreign play. This is a, a diverse voice on stage. I think diverse voice on stage, the term itself means um, acknowledging that it's not diverse enough, which is true. Uh, I'll give an example. Again, Tim uh, Douglas, 
the director of this great that we work with in China, in a talk back with the audience, he once said about when, especially in the States, he felt when there is a person of color being on stage, automatically a lot of the audience assume it is about racial relationship. It is about the race. Yep. But, but, um, but why, I guess, our actors are on the stage because it's about the theater, it's about the, the play itself, it's not about the race. Um, but, but, I, but, but see, this grace, the play itself, actually, it has different um, actors of different skin of color, uh, color of the skins, and it is essentially, you can say it is a play about different races. I think this is this is a process that how this topic is argued about and how to slowly make people realize um, why I'm I am in this topic and and understanding it. From my point of view, actually touring international work, it's never about. Uh, <laughs> diverse voice on stage, even though I have to say some of the programs that when we bring, for example, a Chinese work, either a dance or, or a theater or, or probably music to, I think, states a little bit more, maybe it's seen as something that's adding to the diversity of what is seen on the stage, but it only says that it's, it's not enough diversity. If this is diversity, Guys, you, you you need to work up on doing more of these things. <laughs> um, so I, I definitely see it uh, as a action in process, and uh, it's not just about the diversity. It's actually about the play, where the where the works themselves, yeah. and what you are trying to communicate. Um, theater is political, where art itself is political, but the being political is not a purpose. I think it's just a tool, it's a way of communicating what actually is in that artwork itself. Exactly. That's just my perspective, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree on that because I feel like there's two layers to that conversation because I feel like, you know, one part of this is as a, as a producer recognizing like what's the core message of a piece, like what does a piece mm -hmm. call for and then then walk work around the center mess, message of it and then then identify your producing strategy um according to that message but also if you are a, a presenting institution that like you have a space locally and you're looking at your lineup you're looking at the programming that you want to do this year looking at your season lineup is also important to differentiate like well I guess the the one, one level is knowing that all work is calling for like a universal understanding of humanity. And the another, le another, another okay. level is if you are a white institution and you're looking for diverse voice on stage, is that if you're bringing a piece of work from China and you call it like diverse voice on stage, is that is that like a legit answer to what you're looking for? Um, I think that's like a, whole another conversation to have but yeah mm. oh wow cool. <laughs> <laughs> i got you we're out how we get yeah, yeah. so we is okay for us to talk about disruptive <laughs> topics yeah. which i love yeah um yeah so i that 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 is all of my questions um <laughs> thank you thank so you. much there's a lot of good questions a lot of good questions Oh my god thank you thank you those are those are my burning questions so thank you for that nice. um so i guess thank you so much for joining me today Montel. it was truly wonderful to hear from you and i really appreciate your thoughts and answers and being able to hear your insights um with me sharing your insights with me and with all of us it means a lot to a lot of people to be in conversation with you and I want to thank Howland Theater Commons for live streaming this event. They are an open mm -hmm. free platform for theater makers across the world. And they are extremely resourceful for artists are at all stages of their career. 
So next up in Tran at Home series, we are transitioning everything to podcasts um, with renowned theater makers from China. And just a sneak peek of who we, we will be speaking to, we have uh, playwright Zhou Shen, who wrote uh, Mr. Donkey Lu De Shui and mm. the other works in Chinese that people are very familiar with. And we're also talking to um, Sun Haiheng, who is the founder of Joy Wei Drama, Zhi Lo Hui, um, giving us their take as a theater maker on art making during this pandemic. So um, definitely st stay tuned for that. So thank you all again so much for joining us today. And Meng Tong, best of luck on all of the projects and everything you do. And thank you. Yes, and I want you to know that a lot of what you do is making impacts, making different kinds of impact on this world <laughs> and will continue to be so. Um, so thank you for that. Um, we'll keep doing them. Of course. Um, so two folks who are joining us on Zoom, how around the Facebook today, stay safe, watch a lot of TV, read a lot of books, um, donate to your favorite theaters, if, you know, donate to your favorite artists, Drink a lot of water, stay at home. So positive okay. love, love to you all. I say that all the time. Um, whether wherever you are. So thank you so much. And we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Awesome. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. Everyone. So Have a wonderful evening. Sure. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.